Welcome everyone. Welcome to new episode of Women A Podcast Show with Simona and Alison today. Alison, welcome and thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to our chat. Yeah, me too. And it's it's my privilege to to have you here. And we will talk today about um a uh, lot of things, I think. Uh, but before we start and dive in, I would like to introduce you to our listeners. So everyone, Alison is Mind coach, author of two books. Is it two books so far? It is two, yes. <laughs> okay. And ra- radio uh, presenter, right? Yes. So you have an experience around human behavior, around coaching, counseling uh, with adults and young people as well. And you used to work for NHS. And in 2010, uh, Alison established her own business, Two Minds. And during the last 10 years, she worked one-to-one with many individuals, delivering leadership programs for large corporates and for other businesses as well. So she also works in prisons and schools. Is that still actual, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And also she's an author, as I said, two books, um, A Path Traveled, How to Make Sense of Your Life, and also second book, How to Make Sense of Relationships. And she also presents a chat show called Making Sense. So a lot of things you are doing right there. Amazing, busy woman. I sound very busy, don't I? (laughs) It does, actually, yeah. So I'm really happy you found some uh, time uh, to chat and to have discussion around some topics about um, self-discovery, self-awareness, maybe, confidence, self-image. And you are able to deliver those to our listeners, listeners of Women A Podcast. That'd be lovely. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here again. And um, yeah, I have uh, you have a lot of experience based on what what we um, what I present about yourself uh, already. But tell me maybe uh, when why did why did you decide maybe to swap switch a job from NHS to uh, decide to go on your own path of your own maybe to create your own business. So I think some of that came from my own journey. So I'm always very honest about my own discovery because I wasn't particularly confident. I certainly didn't feel like I had a lot of the answers many, many years ago. And I suppose when I got into the NHS, don't get me wrong, I had some fantastic years. I mean, twenty. I was there for 24 years and probably for 20, I was really happy. And I think it was towards the end, which I'll explain in a minute. But I think when I look back at my life and I look at the way I was encouraged and influenced by people who thought they were doing the right thing for me, I found myself in the NHS, maybe because I was trying to please parents and do the right thing. And actually, the longer I stayed there, the, the I suppose the greater my own realisation about what I wanted to do. And that was a big thing. And it was a big thing to leave the NHS. So I'm not saying for a minute it was an easy, excuse me, an easy decision. But Mm -hmm. it was something that because I'd trained in coaching, in obviously I'd started out as a a counsellor and CBT therapist, you learn on yourself. So you learn the, the models and the experiences self. So I became more confident. I became more able to think, actually, it's what I want to do. I want to set up and do my own thing. So that's kind of almost what happened really is my own confidence increased because I was learning on myself and mm-hmm. I was obviously learning and listening to people. And then I think the other frustration for me and the reason why I left, actually left in the end was, I mean, the NHS is is an amazing thing. You know, we, we are very lucky in this country to still have it. It has its challenges. But I was becoming more and more frustrated because I couldn't help people in the way that I felt they needed because there were restraints. And I get that and we know why they're there, but often it wasn't always in the best interests of the patient or the person. And I just got to the point where I thought, actually, I can't do this anymore. And leaving was massive, massive. Mm-hmm. Why, uh, why, what does it mean it was massive? It was because massive it's long years. You've yeah, been working there. I'd only ever worked for the NHS. I had I'd worked as a you know I'd worked for Boots when I was sixteen, but I'd never worked for any other organisation. I'd never worked in the corporate world. I'd only ever worked for the NHS, mm-hmm. which is obviously a statutory organisation. 
And it was massive because I had a permanent post with a, a solid salary each month and a pension and all this safety and security that everyone was telling me. It's important. It's important. And I was like, I know it is, but I've got to go. I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was it was a strange thing because, yeah, it was it was 12 years ago. So it was we were in a bit of a blip like we are at the moment. And I just knew it was the right thing. And you still think the same until today. It was the right thing, the right decision to do. Never look back. There's been times where, don't get me wrong, you know, it's hard being self-employed and it has its times, but in the main, never look back. And I think one of the things that I'm really keen to say you know, on podcasts like this, you know, in a really positive way is there will always be hurdles for following things like your dream. There'll always mm -hmm. be things that feel and your mind will still say, don't do it, don't do it. You, and yet... If you find something that you love doing and it's your passion, you will be successful. And I think it's having the courage. And I'm always really supportive of people saying, come on, you know, do it, do it, do it, do it. Maybe mm -hmm. we have to put some things in place. You know, obviously, we not everybody can leave a permanent post and set up on their own just like that. There's lots of things that you need to do, but finding the way to do it how you how how are you going to do it rather than just think that you can't and that's you know and I want yeah. people to feel that and, and notice that for themselves yeah definitely um it's not easy path to take because as, as you said it has a lot of challenges it's also the environment and maybe we think in our head what will people say there is no security anymore I might fail but oh. yeah all of them right Yeah, but on the other hand, and from my own experience as well, there is this freedom of doing your thing and doing it according to what you feel is right that That's you maybe you couldn't do in an HS job, right? 100%. You can yeah. choose how you want to work with people. You have more freedom, exactly that. And it was that lovely feeling of deciding what you wanted your day or your week to look like you have to make it happen and there is some fear in there but there's also a real excitement about what you know what what's going to happen I had to learn an awful lot mm -hmm. and and meeting new people to help me with my business was also important having a support network around me that could help me with things that I'd never even had to think about when I worked uh, for the NHS. Mm -hmm. What about the confidence there? Because in my my theory is, okay, my theory is and from my experience is that confidence is the result of the action. Did you have that confidence? Did you have some confidence when you decided to leave NHS and go for your own thing? Or I think my confidence, I think, you know, I, I love the way you described it. My confidence obviously increased as I became where as things started to happen. But I think for me personally, because I hadn't had confidence before, I always looked like I did on the outside, but on the inside, I was often very unsure, had a lot of self-doubt, put myself down and was quite hard on myself. You know, and that was partly the way that I would was had been parented. I'd been parented that it was tough love and you, you know, you had to earn earn it. So I'd learned how to do that. But I, learning how to do Um, different types of coaching and NLP was is another one of my kind of um, program NLP being neuro neuro linguistic programming I I trained in that too and that freed me of a lot of this internal worry and thought so my confidence kind of went up anyway and mm -hmm. I suppose with that it made me go well I, I think I'll leave I suppose I could have stayed in the NHS and just been more confident as a person Anyway, so I think the kind of the two things do go hand in hand. So is it the self awareness of what what I'm feeling, what I'm want, what do I want, what my needs are, and stuff like that, yeah. that basically enabled you to kind of take that decision and step. Just catching, learning how to catch the thoughts that I had that I wasn't good enough and I couldn't do it, and and just being and not being defined by those thoughts became mm -hmm. became part of my success I suppose really and that's why I've made a business that now helps other people do that that's amazing <laughs> it's really amazing um 
So what what your inner thoughts or feelings have been there uh, when you were doing when you were in the middle of the, the transformation? What you had to get rid of, kind of. Mm. I mean, I suppose it was that the the inner critic that you know you're not good enough and there's most people have a time in their life if not quite permanently where they often think they're not good enough they're comparing themselves to others I think I had to absolutely let go of that but I also had to look at myself through a different lens so instead of seeing things as not being good I turned everything over and that was one of my motivations for writing the book because I wanted to share this thing that I'd realized that you know if I was parented quite critically and I needed to see the good in that I needed to see the person that I'd become because of that rather Mm -hmm. than be at the effect of that be because of that and I think then I could start to be myself but with all of the experiences that I'd had good and bad And again, for me, that's what a lot of my work is now is being able to help people see, okay, that happened. Okay, that wasn't great. But what? who are you because of that? And what can you gain and what have you gained because of that? And I think there's so much in there. And that's like your inner power. And when we can learn to use that inner power by seeing your life maybe through a different lens, it can change up all the challenges that you had. Mm-hmm. Are you? Would you say that you are still on the journey of self-discovery? I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think every day, you or you know, every moment, really, everything that happens to us, particularly if you are aware of what's happening and you, know, you get curious. It's one of my favorite kind of words to get curious about things. And I can just because I've learned all this doesn't mean my emotional brain can't have that <laughs> feeling. When something happens and I get that little feeling of doubt or whatever, it's still there. So you're always learning something different. And I learn through other people, what, lots of my work that I do, my clients. I love that. I love being curious about what else might be happening for us all uh, mm-hmm. when we're all connected as well. We are definitely. Um, what about your work in prisons or with the, um, in schools? Like, what were the those biggest lessons maybe that you learn working with with the people in that environment? So, in the prison environment, I used to work before I worked in prisons. I used to work in a drug service, drug and alcohol service. And when I started working with them, it, the, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time putting those people in this other. They're in like an other category, and I hate that because they're not. And for me, it's so important for us to be okay with who you are. And again, it, it, even if it's a challenge that's got you in prison, we've got to be able to use that. And I think that we are all really resourceful as humans, but we don't always realize that. And when I start working with people in the prison situation, they are in a prime position where they feel trapped because they kind of are. But when we are able to learn how to manage the mind, they become, they're, they're almost better than the rest of us out here when they get this stuff because they are really patient. They are really resourceful. They very often very creative people. And I absolutely love being part of see, seeing their development because when they get the fact that they can manage their mind, they can manage their anger, they can manage whatever it is that they did have, wow, you can see the great, great results. So I still believe in in that, that everyone has their own answers and that everyone um, can find a way to, to be peaceful with themselves. And in that environment, they do do it, not all of them, but lots of them do do it. And for me, that, sh- that told me that you can. You, mm-hmm. you can change what, you're thinking, how you're feeling, how you're behaving. And if they can do it, then they, you know, and they and they themselves will say, I can't believe how different I feel about myself, about what's going on for me. And they can see things different their own life differently. Yeah, definitely. I had the privilege, I would call it privilege to work with so, so such a people, um, which are put 
into the category as you describe it like like somehow they are different or somehow they are labeled as that and that but it's basically that's what happened to them um and it's not that what they are that's I think that's what you are reminding them as well, don't you? Definitely. They're not their behaviors. Some yeah. a lot of people, particularly in this country, are in that system. They shouldn't be in the system, most of them. You know, that it doesn't work really. This the, this idea that they're in all in this space together, it almost doesn't work. I mean, it kind of works, but it doesn't work. Um, and I think for us finding creative ways to be able to help them so that maybe they can change things on the outside is 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 what drives the the program that we run forward. Mm-hmm. I want to talk some uh more some um more sentences about self image because with my work as well as a well-being coach I can see some common I wouldn't say traits but common kind of behavior or how we see ourselves in a more uh critical way than how we see others. Mm-hmm. So, what is your what is your opinion or maybe experience of that? I would agree with you that generally we are most people are harder on themselves than they would ever be. I always say to people, you know, the way that we talk to ourselves. If you talk to your friend like that, you probably wouldn't have any friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think as humans, we are very bothered about what other people think of us majority of people so we make up in our heads that people are thinking things about us that we then kind of make happen that makes that becomes our self-image and that's not always good because quite often people will see better things than you see in yourself so if you attach your thoughts on what you think everyone else thinks of you to yourself then that usually is false information Obviously, being bothered about what everyone else thinks, the the sort of irony there is most people are doing the same anyway, so they're not actually thinking about you at all. But I think there is a lot of pressure around self-image, uh, and it's how you process that and where you sit with it. You know, some people are hugely influenced by what everyone else is doing, what everyone else looks like, what everyone else... Social is. media, innit? Yeah, social media. <laughs> that, For that example... And- for example, social media, TV, um, any any sort of media like that. I've seen a difference slightly in that, but I still think it's not helpful to someone who's not feeling good about themselves. You know, you if you're not feeling confident and then you go and look on a load of social media and see people that you then perceive as having more than you or they're better than you or they're prettier than you or whatever, fitter than you, automatically your brain is going to associate them against you and it's 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 damaging it's mm-hmm. really really damaging I, you know i do see people who have created a <clears throat> mindset for themselves based on what what everyone else is doing and that for me says we've got a problem because we're all different we need to be different i'm a big fan of celebrating everyone's differences whatever they are you know being able to get comfortable with the things that you have decided you don't like about yourself. They're still part of you. And how do you, how are you comparing them? Who are you comparing them against? You know, we're all so, so different. Do you know any kind of practical exercises or like uh, something that we can do maybe to increase that healthy self-image or to remind ourselves of something that we did well instead of, um, not well or kind of like success or accomplishment kind of i mean i think we are wired to as as humans to to be quite negative so we are almost wired to focus on the things that we haven't done focus on the things that we don't like the media you know we are flooded with all the things we haven't got as opposed to all the things that we have got and that one of the exercises i often get people to think about it's a very simple exercise but it is literally just what's what's one thing today that you are happy with you know you might have just washed your hair just be happy with that you might have just got something nice through the post just be happy with that because from a brain perspective 
it doesn't know that the bit of the brain where all this stuff lives, it doesn't know the difference between something really small, like I'm pleased because I've washed my hair, compared to I'm pleased because I've run a marathon. This part of the brain doesn't know the difference. So why don't we just utilize this amazing piece of kit that we've got that will be so happy for you, whatever you've achieved, even if you're feeling low, in that moment, if we can just focus on that one thing in that space, your mind can go, you'll get a lift from it. But we don't, we say, oh no, well, it's not that much. I haven't done that. I haven't really achieved anything. We're focused on these massive big goals that we set, which are great to have. But if you focused on them, you're not going to get those nice feelings, that little bit of oxytocin that will lift your mood in that second And I think it's building on that, that we can then start to build a bit more resilience and a little bit more of the good stuff. Kind of momentum towards those bigger goals, maybe. Yeah. Well, because you'll feel better about yourself, which means Mm -hmm. you're in the right part of your brain. You're in your sort of more problem solving, idea generating part of your mind. So you will come up probably with some better ideas about how you're going to reach your goal. So it becomes kind of self-fulfilling in that respect. So mm-hmm. I think that was where I see so many people are focused on chunking their big goals, they're right, they're focused up. And yeah, just finding that one small thing. You know, you might not like, you might not be happy about your weight, but you've, um, you know, you've done your eye makeup nicely today. You're, that part of your brain will happily go along with feeling good about your eye makeup, even if you don't feel happy about your weight. But what mm-hmm. we don't, we focus on all the things that are, that are not good and they're usually bigger things to sort out as well would you say that women are more critical about themselves than men or <laughs> just curious um, from your experience as well yeah, i think well i think what's interesting about women and the, i mean gosh we could do a whole thing among the different yeah, i know <laughs> but i think on this topic i think because women talk about things more, which is great, we are more likely with our girlfriends and our people that we know to say more about things that you're unhappy with. I don't think it's that men are unhappy with things. I just think then they don't tend to express themselves. So they it's as almost as if they then don't talk about it as much. So it's mm-hmm. almost as if it's not as important. Mm-hmm. Um, they That would be possibly off the top of my head, one thought I would have about mm-hmm. The differences with that i think women are just we are more open we're more likely to say whereas men maybe they don't have those conversations with each other you don't tend to hear men saying things like that but i have as many male clients as i do female clients and they they are aware of their challenges and they are aware of some of the things that they don't like so what is the as well impact of our childhood or how we were um yeah our upbringing on all those patterns we basically live according to in adulthood so we are hugely influenced by everything that's ever happened to us but it is about being aware of the negative impact that is where the work is for me whatever has happened to any of us as children and however we were parented it's like it could show up at any point in our adult day so we can any of us can strop and have a tantrum any of us can be that sort of critical person towards each other but i think my work and my work on myself has always focused on not necessarily having to dwell on the past not having to understand spend hours trying to appreciate it, but just being able to notice themes and patterns in what goes on today and think, oh, that's why I do that. It's mm-hmm. And you can just start to see a theme. And I think people, when they get curious, they can start to see more of that. But we are, we are all um, a, as a result of everything that's happened to us but it's how you process it, how you allow your mind to process it, which I think is the most important part of it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, So would you say, have you processed everything kind of that has negatively impacted maybe your life already from the child? Are there any kind of still unconscious patterns that you 
that are running your life? Alison. <laughs> you don't need to answer if you don't want to. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm very open. I think, I think the challenge that we have, the way that the human brain works is that any of us at any point can have an unconscious trigger to an old feeling of, you know, you, you can have somebody who is quite critical just somebody says something on an email even just you know their their sort of tone is quite critical and it can make you feel like ch- a child it can make you feel mm-hmm. really either quite insecure or you know we're all dealing all the time with this association making machine that's basically what the mind is it's constantly looking triggers external things things people say things people do things people don't say things people don't do and the mind is there almost going and tracking back what does this mean to us and so for that reason any of us no matter how trained someone's mind is can be can be reminded of something that we don't like it might be to do with fairness it might be to do with you know having clarity all the time at any point we can have that feeling what i would say because I've done so much work on myself is I would say that the difference now for me compared to maybe me 15 years ago, for example, is my recovery rate is quicker. So I might recovery feel, rate. Yeah. My recovery rate. So I might feel sad about something or I might feel a bit worried or anxious about something, but my, I, my ability to bounce back is quicker mm-hmm. now because I can think, hang on, I'm not going down that route. I'm not going to let that person bother me like that. And I'll do something to kind of, I've got my strategies, many, many different things that I might do. I might go outside, I might write it down, I might do a bit of journaling, I might do something with that. So what I would call my recovery, my bounce back is probably as quick as it can okay. be <laughs> now. Whereas back in the day, I might have been stuck with something for weeks and weeks, keep running over the same conversation and, her, you know, one looking for an answer there. And I, I don't tend to look for answers there anymore. I would just try and stop myself. And I think that's what I would be encouraging everyone, people listening here and any clients or through my work, through my books, is to help people just pause and just think, hang on a minute, what's happening? What am I going to do? Because otherwise your past does define you because it repeats and we find ourselves in the same situation time and time again. Mm-hmm. And for me, when we're in that repeat cycle, that's your time to go, right, something needs to change now. And obviously the trick is the how, which obviously is more complicated. But just to know I'm in this again, I got to do something different, I think is is where people can start. start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, once we put focus or kind of that realize realization of what's going actually on we can start yeah. working on it and change it yeah definitely we've got to be aware of what you want to change before you can change it yeah yeah how to get aware how to be more aware i think many people asking the question yeah a lot of people talk about this and yet it's mm. almost this it's almost the simplest thing because from a from the way that our brains are wired is there is only now this minute mm-hmm. now And then there'll be another now, now. And I think training yourself to be more in the now, present moment, learning very simple techniques so that you can start to practice it for when you might need it if you something does happen. For me, it is about being in the room, being the room that you're in, what's around you, what can you hear, what can you feel, can you feel the seat in your back, can you feel your feet on the floor, and just being able to train yourself to bring your attention back into this moment right now. Um, some people use anchors where they, they'll squeeze you know, their, their fingers together or they'll do something that just brings their attention to now. And then once you've practiced that, which are mindfulness exercises, meditation, these are all practicing doing this, bringing your attention to now. And if you practice doing that, then if something happens and you feel super anxious or super sad or super worried, if you've practiced it, you can just say to yourself, it's okay, I'm just going to do this. And then you've settled all that um, 
chemical imbalance and then you can maybe think about what do I need to do next so many people are trying to problem solve for things that are going are not going well when they're in that really emotional part of the response and there is no answers in there there's nothing Mm -hmm. there's nothing great in there they say or somebody said to me I think that you should never make a decision in emotional state 100%. like important decision yeah or anything well what do what, what do what do they say what well what do british people always say when, when there's a crisis let's put the kettle on <laughs> they have a tea no yeah let's oh, have tea. yeah they do. no they really do <laughs> that, but that in itself is a kind of like right let's just hang on let's just stop let's not try and decide what we need to do right now let's put the kettle on and we'll and in that space people can just maybe start to feel a little bit more settled then they get a cup of tea in the hand and if you just spend a few minutes noticing the warm cup of tea in Mm -hmm. your hand that's being in the now that's bringing your attention to the awareness to the now and then you might be able to start generating some ideas about what needs to happen next yeah what are the practically kind of again no exercises but kind of routine that you have to yourself to bring yourself into the present moment? Did you maybe practice every day or every week? Or I mean, I tend to, you probably do, when you do it a lot, you probably do it without even realizing now. So I think sometimes it is, you know, when you feel like you're feeling very busy or feeling very overwhelmed or feeling kind of quite worried about something, being able to bring your attention to the to this, wherever you are, by using your five senses, I think is one of the most simplest but most powerful exercises. And the reason why it's so great is you don't need any equipment. You can do it. No one else needs to know you're doing it. And you're literally just asking yourself to see five things that are around you and just list five things that you can literally see where you're sitting right now. And then ask yourself, what's four things that you can hear? And by just stopping and listening to what else might be around you, You're bringing your awareness and then maybe three things that you could feel. The chair under my arm, my foot on the floor, you know, my clothing, something like this. It brings your attention. And I sometimes, you know, even even I will do it. I'll just sometimes just stop when I can feel myself being a bit sort of busy and just say, right, what am I doing? Just stop. Just stop. And it'll give your mind a job to do by just counting and looking for things because your mind is always going to be doing something and then you've got that moment to just pause regroup yourself and then what do I need to do now that's one of the techniques that I use Mm -hmm. and share with lots and lots of people it's so simple and yet you can do it and no one needs to know you're doing it either Mm -hmm. what I say to my clients or participants as well like you need to make your brain your friend, kind of. Because sometimes, you, and many times, you feel that it goes against you. It's just not helping you out at all. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and you said... We can be our said, own worst enemy, can't we? Say it again, sorry. It can be our own worst enemy. It can, right? Because it's there to keep us safe, most mostly, right? Yes. Yeah. Let's just try to how, learn how to manage it, how to keep it under control in a way. But I think coming back to something that you said earlier about um, techniques, sometimes if you are thinking things about yourself or about the situation and you can feel that you are being quite negative and the mind is primary job is to look after us and to keep us safe and it can sometimes be your own worst enemy. Sometimes a strategy to ask yourself, what would I say to my friend? Right now, what would I, whatever you're doing, what would be, what would I say to my friend? And quite often we just say to, you know, it's okay. Just, you know, you've got this or just something kind, just something that you would say that would be quite simple and kindly. And I think, you know, from, from there, that might just pause your thoughts and then you can think about what's next. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so Alison, what was the biggest challenge or what did you find most challenging so far in the process of your self-discovery? Is there anything specific that you remember that 
was very kind of challenging to overcome or I mean I think it is when you're breaking old habits patterns in yourself you know if you were for me I was you know I was very unsure of myself I was quite critical I think just it took a long time to break that you know I'm under no illusion how long it takes for people to really be able to change up how they see and how well you know what they see in terms of self-belief so I think it was you know chipping away I think that the, the biggest challenge was just constantly just chipping away um at that and I think one of the things that I have um I learned to do and I spent a lot of time not wanting to do this but I suppose one of the other challenges is sitting with uncomfortable feelings and learning how to do that because mm-hmm. we naturally would want to run away from them look for distractions you know try and fix yourself you know some people do it where they have a horrible breakup and then they rush into another relationship because they're trying to they don't want to sit with that horrible feeling they've got and i think one of the most challenging things when you're on a journey like this is to force yourself to stay curious about why you're feeling like you're feeling because from there you will learn your biggest stuff yeah But sometimes you don't want to sit with that horrible stuff that horrible feeling of sadness or fear or guilt or regret or any of the feelings that come but sitting with them you'll usually get some great knowledge for yourself yeah but sometimes you you feel and what somebody told me as well before that they know how to help themselves or how to heal themselves from the things that happened to them before that running their life or till today but they don't feel strong enough mm. right so what would you say to that person does that person need just take it very little small steps slowly or Or just uh, come back to it later when maybe they feel in a better place yeah I think I think if you do feel um very bruised and very you know very wounded and not able to deal with some of these difficult things then I think that it is all about timing I think mm. sometimes it is a good idea to to be distracted you know if, if you feel really rubbish it's a good idea to go go out with your friend or do something sometimes but I think that the pick the bit that people usually fall at by doing that is they then don't go back to it and that it gets left unresolved mm-hmm. so that so I think that the the balancing act there is and I think you know it's it's a good question because I do think yep yeah, it's all about timing it's all about the being with the people that you trust there's lots of components to dealing with our challenges but I think the most important thing is that at some point you come back to it so whether you do journaling whether you see someone like me someone like you you know you come and talk to your friend whoever it is just know that you you are going to need to come back to it because if it feels uncomfortable it means there's something unresolved and So that's the only thing I would say but yep I totally agree with you there was, there's been many times in my life where I haven't felt able to deal with this thing that I know is in there um and giving yourself a bit of time off if you like to to come back to it but just know because I know from my own experience I've done that where I've kind of bypassed it somehow I've squished it down and then when you have a challenge your subconscious mind often will give you a everything else that you haven't dealt with all at the same time so you'll hear people who maybe have a loss and they're absolutely beside themselves with emotion it's almost as if the mind's gone oh, well while you're here could you just deal with all these other things that you haven't dealt <laughs> with and and that's when people often become really stuck so mm-hmm. so I think you're right you know it's a good question let's do it when it's the right time if you don't feel strong enough but know that you've got to come back to it Mm-hmm. it will it will come back up it'll come back on its own otherwise mm-hmm. and when you said you've been working with people in prisons and drugs and stuff like that people who have been taking drugs that's the way how they running away in yes. a way isn't it yeah yeah and healthy it's, coping. It's a solution it's a solution for to a point you know it it, it works to a point they were you can free yourself 
using those kind of things, but it doesn't ultimately help. And that's where I, you know, obviously would would rather spend time helping people really free themselves so that they can do it without those kind of distractions and and covers cover ups. I find very inspirational talking to people who went through addictions or who went through these unhealthy coping mechanism strategies and who were able to find that turn over, turn point yeah. and say, that's enough. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. And like, it's so inspirational to hear what they went through and how low they've been. And then now we're talking to some like completely different person. Sitting across the I love table. That. And I think one of the challenges that we've got in society is a lot of these people find themselves in services and in prisons and all sorts of different things where everyone else is telling them what to do, telling them that you need to do this and you need to get a job or you need to whatever. But it, it's not until that person has that thing that happens to them where they go, I've had enough of this. Uh-huh. And, that, and that's where... I suppose one of the reasons why, you know, it became a little bit frustrating for me in the in the health service because, you know, you, ha- you had uh, processes that you had to follow with people and you had to do certain things with them, get them drug free and things. And if people aren't ready, then they're not ready. They need to have their, their hook, their change in their life, their opportunity for them to go, I have had enough of this life. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I've made that decision and now I'm ready to find the little steps to be able to do it. And it's a big journey, no doubt, for a lot of them. But it is, I agree with you. I've met some amazing people who've got the most amazing stories and it just blows your mind to think that they've actually achieved some of the things that they do. They're, they are great teachers to a lot of people. Yeah, and what hurts my heart is when people are still labelling them or judging them for what they did in the past. It's just. But then haven't we all got our things? Yeah, I agree with you. But that's where those people are being very biased, aren't they? Because we've all Mm -hmm. got things that we've done. Might not be the same, but we've all got things that we've done. So they are being very unfair, very judgmental, because that person will also have things that they've done that they have changed. It just might not mm-hmm. be those kind of things. One of the, I wouldn't say problems, but something that maybe need to be changed. Do you think it's also the kind of the way we see and we try to advise and we judge and we try to apply like one solution to everyone? I think systems definitely do yeah. that. Yeah. I think, you know, we've got to have systems. The education is one of them. The health service is another prison service, uh, the uh, criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. They 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 do treat people like one size fits all, and we are not in any shape or you know you and I are having this experience together today to create this podcast, but we're still having a different experience. And I think too many systems don't allow for for us all to interpret things differently to hear things differently and to then respond differently. Mm -hmm. Back to your self-development, Alison. Uh, What would you say to, if you meet Alison from like many years ago, your young self, what would you tell her now if she sits across the table to you? Um, I mean, I suppose it sounds a bit kind of bit, uh, bit cliche really, but... You know, I think to not worry about trying to please everybody else and to find my to find myself to, you know, if I was looking at myself to say, go your own way, you know, do what's right for you. Because I was heavily influenced, like a lot of people are, by what everyone else thought I should do. And I didn't have the confidence to be able to say, no, 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 I'm doing this then. But now if I look at my, if I was talking to myself now, I would say, you know, work on finding your path, whatever it is that's right for you. Work towards that rather than be influenced by what everyone else thought was best for me. Mm-hmm. You don't need to fit in, right? Yeah, just be. <laughs> just I be. love it. I love nothing more to, to see somebody who's you know, literally just being their best self. And that might not be the same as everyone else, 
but I just, I celebrate that. I absolutely love, I love talking to people who, yeah, they're a bit different and they're just doing their thing. And I love that, I, you know, it's why do we all have to try and be, be the same, in the same lane, just be in your lane. Don't worry about what <laughs> Have your lane. Be in your lane. Find <laughs> yeah. your lane, be in that Find lane. your lane. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love this. Um, I think we all should strive for authenticity and being just able to express ourselves, our true ourselves. I think um, so. What do you what do you admire about yourself? Oh gosh. <laughs> Come on. That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> what do I admire I about myself? I mean I am I am very determined. Um not always. Some days I can be you know faffing about and not not being determined but I've always strived to be determined I'll have a go at anything I've always been somebody who will have a go at anything but I think one of the things that I can see now in a positive way is one of my qualities that I do admire is I'm quite I'm fiercely independent and I used to see that as a negative from the way that I was being brought up that, you know, I was, I didn't need anybody else. And I used to see it as a really bad thing. And I see it differently now because I see that I am that person because of the way that my mum and dad did bring me up. And I'm grateful to that now because I've, you know, I don't need anyone, although I need it, you know, I need lots of people. I just don't need anyone per se. So I think these qualities come because of the adversity, if you like, that I've faced. And I suppose I feel quite proud of that and then I am quite open to sharing that so that hopefully it'll inspire other people I haven't just been and done lots of courses I've lived and breathed you lived so through much yep. of my message literally on my hand on my heart I've I lived and breathed so much of my message that I feel you know I want to share that I want to help people and I think that. people and our um clients or customers they they feel when you share something which you live through comparing to something that you just read or what you are supposed to deliver. Yeah. Don't you feel that? Yeah, definitely. And people can <laughs> tell. People can tell somebody who's been on a course and got, you know, might know lots of co- like some knowledge compared to somebody who's actually got some lived experiences. And I've got obviously tons of stories of my own, but hundreds of people's stories as well that, people can tell I think that authenticity is absolutely critical uh, and and for me it, it and I and I respond well when I can feel somebody's telling me an authentic story so I know that that's important to to most people mm-hmm. I want to go back uh still to confidence building kind of thing because I think that's that is a, like a huge topic which which you might feel that some people might feel or I feel sometimes that I'm lacking confidence to take that step or take that decision. So what kind of exercise or what kind of thing I shall do to help myself to actually do it or just just do it, just stop thinking and do it? <laughs> what do That's think? definitely one way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Maybe do some of the techniques we've talked about today, which is bringing yourself into the moment, pause, yeah. stop. You know, as soon as we listen to that emotional response which is five times quicker then we're already in this place where there aren't lots of answers there isn't all the confidence that we need so I think pausing and being aware of just what's happened without any judgment does help us tap into all our good stuff so I think that in itself is is something that um that is helpful but I I think one of the things that about confidence is it is quite personal really because we, the, the, when we're measuring ourselves about how confident you are what i'm always mindful of is well what who are you measuring yourself against because we are all so different and a lot of people think that confidence is about being very chatty and being very you know, almost um, gregarious and bold and all these things. And actually, it 
it isn't necessarily anything to do with that. You know, some of the most confident people can be really quiet people who've got a lot of reflective thoughts and very, so I think we need to be really careful that we don't fall into a comparing ourselves to others, but B, who are you? What are you measuring your confidence? If you say you haven't got confidence compared to what? And is it, are you just tapping into a sort of unknown fear of, you know, I always think confidence, you can't put confidence in a wheelbarrow. So how are you going to work on finding it? And like you say, maybe you, maybe you've said it, just do it. Just, just decide what you're going to do and just do it. Maybe that is what we need to be doing more of because we need to be careful that we're not um, comparing ourselves or stopping ourselves because we're looking for this thing that's going to give us all this confidence. And I don't know what it is sometimes. I think it's that moment by moment. It's that pushing yourself. It's that being your own best friend. Come on, you can do this and just do it. And sometimes that's all it takes. And sometimes we're looking for something. We're, we like define it like it's a thing. And I wonder sometimes whether that's what gets us into stuck. Or... stuck. Yeah. 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 Because it's that moment by moment, isn't it? The brain is um, only focused on this this moment. Um, and then we add all the, well, I didn't do it well last time, and all the other past stories, which are just thoughts. They don't have to mm -hmm. define us now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alison, if you could choose to have one superpower, what would that be? Oh. I'm jumping from question to question, from area to area. But <laughs> <laughs> right. What superpower would I have? Oh. Yeah. Um, I would, I think just just oh, one, one. Okay, <laughs> one. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say any of the usual things. I want to say something different. I want to say I would love to be able to help, just literally fast track people, and not have to stick for as long as I did with some of their problems. So, if there was a way that I could help them, just be able to see their life in this kind of fast track and then be able to help themselves understand what's mm. next because that's it, interesting it's, it's kind of never going to happen because we have to go through yeah um the, the pain we have to work these things out but you know as a superpower is kind of almost something that's not not necessarily real um I guess that would be yeah for, to, mm -hmm. to, to be able to fast track to be able to have a little little magic one that could just fast track people when I see people who are absolutely broken hearted or you know devastated about something just to be able to get them fast fast tracked would be amazing mm -hmm. nice nice okay um what would you like to be remembered for like what, what would you like to be your legacy one day I think what we talked about before being or people seeing that I've got an authentic message and I deliver it authentically. I think if any, you know, mm -hmm. if I could ever hear anyone saying it would be that they felt that I, I understand the complexity of it because I'm lived and breathed it. And that is how I share my message so that people, don't, otherwise people become hard on themselves. They think that everyone else seems to be happy and I'm not. So I think that, I think just that I'm, I'm authentic to my my work and my message, and and hopefully that inspires others to keep going and keep, the same, finding, yeah. keep finding their own answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, authenticity. Yeah, good, so. nice. Um, I love the conversation we have because we covered so much. I think from different angles as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been lovely. Yeah. Um. What would be your final message to to listeners? I think that we are naturally hard on ourselves as humans, and for me, I think being, yeah, just being kinder, just giving yourselves that little metaphorical hug, not taking ourselves so seriously as humans as adults. We take ourselves so so seriously, and I think if we can just sort of lighten it up, it'll help us tap into all of your answers, which are already there, all within you. It's just finding that route to get there. So yeah, not being so hard on yourself. Take yourself less seriously and see what comes up. 
Nice. Um, tell me what your um, two books are about. Just briefly, if you can share. Yeah, sure. So the first one, um, they're both called A Path Travelled. Uh, the first one is A Path Travelled, How to Make Sense of Your Life. And that takes you on a journey to understand a the mind so some of the sort of mechanisms of the mind look at pa the past look at how you're influenced by your childhood and then it looks at kind of patterns and habits that you'd expect to see so people pleasing fear of rejection all of those kind of things and then it's full of exercises to help you be able to break some of these habits so that one takes you on a little self-discovery journey and then the second one is focused on relationships so that goes through the sort of the highs and lows of intimate relationships. So what, what can go wrong, how to make it work, how to get out of a relationship that's not healthy, all um, about new love so we don't fall into the traps that sometimes, even though it's gorgeous, the, the challenges that we have with relationships. And that's also got exercises through it. Um, uh, but I think the thread between both of the books are we've got to get a relationship with ourselves before we can have a relationship with anyone else and for me both books they they are standalone books so you can just read one and not the other but they but that's the thread through all of them really is that to be successful with others we've got to understand ourselves first yeah thank you for the reminder that's that's very important i think to have yeah. that healthy relationship with ourselves should be the yeah. priority yeah Definitely. That's what helps. That That's my own experience as well, is that, you know, in the times when I look back at my own relationships that didn't work out, that was because I wasn't in a good space myself. Yeah, Not, They Same possibly here. weren't right. Yeah, they possibly weren't right <laughs> for me as well. But yeah. it was very much um, apparent because of my own self. You chose to be with them, right? So it comes to your decision kind of. Yeah. So, yeah. And you learn loads about yourself through the relationships that don't work if mm -hmm. you're able to look at them slightly differently yeah where can we find the books can we find them online or yes they are you can get them on amazon uh, as, mm -hmm. as any books are but i do also sell them through my own website where i'll do signed copies if anybody wants them i'll personally send them out mm -hmm. um i have got them in a few bookshops i'm proud to say in my area But, and that was really important to me because I did launch both of them in the pandemic and I wanted to be able to have it where people could physically go into a bookshop. So as soon as I could, I did go and get them into onto bookshelves, which was mm -hmm. really important to me because I love a, I love a bookshop. Still. Yeah. 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 Still like a hard copy is still. Yeah. 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 Well, I think some people do. I mean, you, the, my books are all available eBooks as well. Uh, but mm -hmm. for some people, the exercises, you almost need to connect your head, your hand and your heart. You know, the three, you need to write, think about it, put it through your heart and then write, write mm -hmm. with your pen. So I'm I'm still quite keen on people physically writing things yeah. uh, for exercises. But again, everyone's different. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to include the links to, to the books, uh, to the description of the episode. So oh. everyone can access and purchase. And also... Can you tell me briefly in a few words what what's the um, chat show about? Yeah, so it's all, it's a community radio called uh, Wirral Wave, and Making Sense is basically a, an hour of bringing some of this content to life. So I always have guests on, and we talk about a specific topic, usually um, bringing the content of the books to life, but also just talking about life's challenges so there's we've done one on imposter syndrome we've done one on the power of the outside we've done one on the relationship between your physical body and your emotional body for example and mm -hmm. I always bring a guest on to or into the studio if they're local to me and we play uh, some music so we have about three or four or five tunes um, either upbeat or we link the tune to the show to the content of the show so it's a it's a very light uh, fun easy going hour uh, all of the episodes are on youtube on our two minds youtube so any any um separate to the radio they're there anyway and for me i think we all need to really think about what we're listening to 
So I want to create, I wanted to create a show that was a bit like this podcast where it's positive. It gives people some little information, one small thing that they could maybe attach rather than all of the other noise that's going on out there that mm-hmm. is just fear based. So I wanted to create something that, and for some people reading books is quite hard. So I feel that making sense brings the books to life without actually people having to read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't read the book, but we bring sort of sections of it up there to life. Mm-hmm. Wow, you are you are really a bu- busy woman. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you what do you feel mostly connected to with all of those roles? If I could call it like a coach, um, facilitator, radio presenter, what do you feel most connected with? I love working in teams. So I think mm-hmm. when I'm, uh, I do a lot of leadership and management sort of support, helping people in businesses think about how they can communicate and encourage and support each other. And I enjoy being in a space. I work quite, quite experientially. So having everyone in the same room and really starting to help get them to think about what's actually happening. That's probably in a in a group setting is where I'm, um, I enjoy the most. I mean, I've obviously work one to one and have done that for thirty years or something. So I suppose I'm very comfortable working with individuals one to one. But I've enjoyed the radio, and one of the reasons why I've enjoyed the radio is because that was putting pushing me out of my comfort zone because I wasn't a radio presenter. I'm still learning how to do it, I suppose. But you know, again, it was good fun for me to. And I love music. So Mm -hmm. the idea of learning, pushing myself and being able to play some of my favorite tunes is just the best. Thank you, Alison. Thank you so much for sharing um, all the experience and knowledge, information with us all today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And as I said, I will include all the links that were mentioned today and um, yeah, the ways how you can access and buy the books or, or the radio show to the description of the episode and yeah let us know what you think as well dear audience please let us know your thoughts feedback anything and or any kind of ideas for next guest and i will try to accommodate your needs as well and yeah thank you so much alison again thank you thank you so much